Welcome back, everybody. It is great to be here. As always, lovely to see everybody here in the live chat. All I ask, as usual, if you just keep it cordial and polite, then uh, that'd be great. Um, normally, my interviews go for around an hour, but uh, some of you may have seen that I'm actually carrying a, an injury at the moment. I've torn a calf muscle. So as I'm sat now, I'm not in too much uh, bad pain. I've took some painkillers. But if it gets really bad, and you know, I've mentioned to Matthew as well that we may go a little bit shorter, but we'll just see how we go. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, so yeah, let's not waste any more time. Um, I'd like to welcome my guest today, Matthew Roberts. Matthew, how are you? Good. How are you, Vinny? Thank you for having me. I'm not bad at all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I think the best thing to do really is just to give a bit of a background on yourself, if you don't mind, which led you to sort of joining uh, the military, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, well, uh, what led me to joining the military is that I, I liked, I really liked traveling and, um, I thought to myself, well, you know, I, I was going to join the military. So I figured what branch of the military is going to have me traveling the most. And I, it, being on a big gray floating ship, um, seemed to be the best option, you know, cause you're constantly moving. Um, yeah. And, and so I, uh, I definitely loved seeing the world and traveling. So that, that was, that was kind of why I, I chose the Navy. Um, and I, and I chose, I, I wanted to choose an interesting job, right? I didn't, I didn't want to just do anything, um, that, uh, that you would typically think of as being, um, you know, a naval seafaring job. Uh, so I decided to go into cryptology. Um, and that's how I became a naval cryptologist. So what does that entail exactly? Um, well, it, it entails quite a bit of school um, to learn how to do your job. It's it's very complex. Um, I work with a lot of complex equipment. Um, you know, and it's just, uh, it's a very highly technical job. And it's uh, it's a subset within intelligence. Um, it's, right. it's, uh, signals intelligence is what I, what I did all day long. So in your sort of younger years, again, before you joined the military with regards to the UFO subject, what was your level of interest? If, if any at all, um, I had, I had absolutely no interest in it whatsoever, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I would see like ancient aliens come on TV and I'd kind of roll my eyes and change the channel uh anytime i saw someone bringing it up it was just like okay time to walk away now um <laughs> i i have no interest in this whatsoever and i thought it was you know just the the realm of tinfoil hats and conspiracy theories i didn't think that there was anything to it um and and i i didn't think it was at all interesting to be oh. honest i i just me and ufos were not something that went together <laughs> yeah it's understandable and I've, I've met a lot of people that are like that and then obviously since they've maybe had an experience or a sighting it's you know it's a paradigm change to them so oh yeah, yeah i can understand sure. that so let's let's lead up to kind of what happened in 2015 um i mean everybody's familiar i think with the the gimbal and the, the go fast videos but um am i right in saying that you were stationed at the time in uh, off of oceana in that kind of training range Yes. Uh, yeah, we were, we were, we were, the ship was actually stationed out of Norfolk, Virginia at the time. Right. Um, and so we were doing our workup cycle and that entailed kind of going down uh, by Florida um, like we often did because we were an aircraft carrier. I mean, we, our job was to capture planes, um, catch them and catch and release all day long that's what we would do pilots pilot proficiency training they would come and land on the deck um and and we would do that kind of thing all day long but this time we were doing our workups our workup cycle getting ready for deployment so 
you know, they put you in these situations where they say, okay, you're off the coast of this or that, you know, hostile country. Uh, and then they throw these scenarios at you to see how are you going to react? And they'll test the entire ship, right? They'll, they'll, uh, we'll go into, you know, play acting scenarios of, you know, there's a missile inbound port side and it's just hit the side of the ship. And all the way from the, the skipper down to the lowliest seaman on the ship, you know, how are, how are you going to react to that? And how well are you going to do it in terms of flooding, putting out fires, um, getting the word out that this has happened to you, that you've been attacked? Um, you know, and it's just and, and that's what we were doing out there um, at the time. And did you have a good relationship with a lot of different people on the ship, you know, whether it be the pilots uh, and things like that? Was it was it like a group thing or was it was it quite separated? Um, you know, it was really it was quite separated for me uh, in my particular job. Uh, so we worked uh, in a skiff on the ship, um, which I, I'm, everybody's heard a lot about this with you know, on the news with the Trump documents and things like that. <laughs> but but a skiff is just where you keep sensitive, compartmented, classified information. Um, and so that was where I worked. And of course, not everyone had access to this space. There was, you know, an access list. So it was very tightly controlled who was coming and going. So I didn't I didn't really see a lot of people throughout the course of my day. I just kind of stayed in there. Um, but, uh, and I would communicate from there, whatever I needed to communicate to people. Um, but the pilots, I did see them coming and going from the flight deck all the time. You know, um, my space just so happened to be by one of the ready rooms. So, uh, I would see pilots coming and going all day long. And I, and in fact, when, when the two pilots that came forward on the show unidentified, when they came forward, I, was watching that show and I was like, oh yeah, I, I recognize them. I, I remember them because I would see them in the hallways all the time, you know, coming and going from the ready rooms. So how many squadrons did you have? Because obviously Ryan Graves from the Red Rippers, um, was there more than one sort of group on the... Um, you know, I, I didn't even really get into it that much. I don't, I, I don't really know. Uh, how okay. many squadrons we had? We had a, like a Hilo squadron. We had the fighters, obviously. Then uh, a Marine squadron. Um, I don't know. There might have been more than I might be leaving someone out. I don't know. <laughs> no That's fine. No problem at all. So let's bring it right up to the day um, or, or around the time of of these interactions with these objects. How did you first hear about it, and what was the kind of general buzz uh, surrounding it like? Um, yeah, I, I was, you know, I was, we were sitting in our space and, uh, we had just finished the workup cycle. So we had someone in our space, a, a handful of people that had come on board to evaluate us specifically and how we reacted to things. Um, and so we had just finished up that portion, um, to my knowledge, the entire, um, com 2X was, was finished. It was over. Um, and there weren't to be any more exercises. So we were just kind of waiting for our grade, um, and to be debriefed on as to how well we did. Um, I knew we did well, obviously. I mean, I was, I was pretty certain of that. Um, but, uh, so as we're sitting there waiting, um, one of my buddies comes in and he worked in, um, well, he worked in Civic, which wow. is which is the Carrier Intel Center, and he he was an intelligence specialist, and so he he was working more closely with what the pilots were doing, and he would do that on a daily basis. Um, and so he comes in and he says, "Hey, you know, check this out." Um, and so he shows me where it is the the file is and I go onto my computer and I open it up and I take a look at it. And, um, that was, it was the gimbal footage. Um, 
and the night before i know that we had um launched uh launched some jets and i wasn't sure why i, re I remember cli i was climbing into my rack and i heard that they were launching jets and i thought i thought i thought the the exercises were over i'm not sure what's going on you know but uh so that that was what was going on apparently um and i of course i could not watch this footage enough it was there there was there were some files there right and among them were the gimbal and the go fast footage uh and so i find i found myself just you know watching this footage over and over again because it was just to me kind of the most amazing thing i had ever seen in my life you know i've yeah. seen I've seen footage, you know, shot from gun cameras. Uh, I was very familiar with that. Um, and so when I saw this, it just kind of didn't make any sense the way it was flying. Um, and it didn't seem to have, you know, the regular kind of uh, flight surfaces that you would see. Um, and so uh, I, I think I kind of immediately knew what it was. Uh, and it was kind of a it, it was a very big shock to me because <laughs> because, you know, I had no interest in this whatsoever. Didn't think it was real. Uh, didn't really care. And then here it is smacking me in the face, you know. Yeah. Um, and so that was that was a very eye opening moment for me. Yeah, I can imagine. There's a lot of, been a lot of talk recently about the actual length of the original footage captured of the gimbal in, in particular, with people saying that there are still another four minutes of footage that is not out in the public. Yep. Did you see a longer version than what is currently out there? I did not. No, I did not see a longer version. I The clip I saw was the, the exact same clip, exact same length. Um, so it had been cut down to that by the time I saw it. Um, so, so I, I wasn't aware of any longer version, but I'm, you know, I, I'm sure that there not only are longer versions, but other, other videos as well. I'm, I'm sure of it. I mean, I, cause I, I knew that I, I, I had heard that the pilots were sharing videos kind of amongst themselves, uh, of, of what was happening. So there's more, I'm, I'm sure of that. Yeah. Excellent. Because I think with the the way the pilots are describing the objects and they're looking at the situational awareness screen saying that there's obviously there's a fleet of them. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I can just imagine that if that footage was was made available, that it would definitely change the conversation and even further. So, uh, yeah, that would be amazing. And um, I just want to highlight this question here from your name. She says, how clear was the footage that you saw? Is it the same version that was made public? Yes. Yes, it was. Uh huh. It was because I mean, uh, there's also conversation, isn't there, in, about the possibility of it just being another F 18 shot from a certain angle where you don't see the kind of thermal heat coming off right. of it. So, what do you say to things like that? Uh, I, I tell them that that's an impossibility. I mean, the, the pilot's essay is going to tell them if that's uh, if that's a you know friendly F 18 or not. Um, and, and and you know, it's just. <sighs> I, when I hear people say that, it, it just bothers me to no end because it, it it implies that we don't know what we're doing in the Navy, right? And which, of course, is ridiculous. We know exactly what's going on around the ship, right? And so if we have an unknown, something like that escalates very quickly, right? Yeah. We don't we're not just like, oh, unknown, flying around the ship, turn out the lights if you're the last one in the room and let's all hit the sack, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's not the way that happens. This is this is a multi-billion dollar aircraft, uh, or, or we, we have billions of dollars worth of air aircraft on board, not to mention the ship itself. I mean, that's a lot of money um, riding on that, and not to mention human life. So it just it's it's absolutely ridiculous to me when people say or, or imply that that we somehow wouldn't know what that is right i mean that's why the pilots went up there to take a look to begin with because we didn't know what it was so that that's what they were doing out there and so it's just uh it's just ridiculous these people like mick west that imply otherwise you know 
It's just yeah. the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So, you know, you say that the pilots were sent out there specifically to look for these things. Does that mean there would be other data? So like radar? Oh, or, yeah. Which yeah, hasn't for sure. Been, been made public either. So, uh, you know, if we did have all this data, it certainly would paint a better picture for everybody to, to kind of really get to know what it potentially could be or certainly what it wasn't you know right uh, exactly yeah so. yeah and the, and the pilots going up there they would have seen that this is a jet right this a, a jet within their uh their scopes that they're looking at right they they've seen that a million times by this point they're not going to be fooled into thinking a jet is is something it's not at this point okay. they're very well trained in that way so, you know, having accumulated as many flight hours as you would have to have in order to be going on deployment number one and then also taking off and landing on a carrier, which is not easy. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you pretty much know what things are um, when you see them. Yeah, absolutely. And... I just wanted to quickly touch upon the GoFast video as well, because if I'm right in saying that was shot the same day, uh, wasn't it? Uh, you know? it, you know, it may have been. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. It, it may have been different days. I don't know. So this, this whole event, right, uh, went on for several days. This wasn't right. just a, a one day event. Um, and so that's, that's another reason why I have a problem with some of these explanations. Like people want to say it's drones or or whatever and i don't i don't know how you would have that kind of battery life or fuel on board that for several days you're doing this um <clears throat> and people say oh it could have come from you know a cargo ship nearby or whatever but uh, i again i just it, it just really bothers me that people think that we have no idea what's going on. It, may, it makes it sound like we couldn't find our way out of a paper bag. We can put a, a missile on a pinpoint um, out there somewhere on land, but but if we had to find our way out of a paper bag, we couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just, it's a ridiculous thought. It really is. And so if, it, of course, we would have known what ships were around us, we would have had a very good situational awareness of what was going on. So I, there would have been no way that drones could uh, somehow creep up on us like that. It's just, um, it's, it's not very believable. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a question here from George. He asks, if did the pilot get a response from the UAP? Um, a friend or foe? If so, what was the response? Uh, you know, I I don't I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I I heard I had heard um, recently. This wasn't something I knew at the time, but that uh, something that I heard was that there were that it was identified as friendly. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I don't know. Interesting. Definitely interesting. So. You mentioned that you were at the end of the workup, so I assume like not long after this event happened that you then went on deployment, if, if I'm right. So yeah. did the buzz continue once you kind of left the training areas and, and went overseas? Oh, you know, I it, it really, I, I don't know. So the, it, the, the thing about it, too, is that the ship was not a buzz with this, right? Most, right. Peop most people on the ship had no idea what was happening. Okay. Um, this was limited to just people kind of, in the know or within intelligence or that had clearances this wasn't uh the whole ship knowing okay. about this but but i i you know i would say that for the most part uh the ship was kind of a buzz with it at the time in terms of the people that i was coming in contact with um you know i at one point i was going into a briefing and i heard a couple of the pilots standing on the doorway to the room where this briefing was happening inside civic and i they were saying they were talking about it right they were like oh have you seen the ufos you know the the videos and so they were kind of discussing that so so people were talking about it um i kind of didn't really feel a need to talk about it um and and, and then it just kind of went away when we went on deployment but you know, I, that same buddy of mine, um, I was walking past him one day, um, 
actually headed to Civic and he was headed the opposite direction. And, uh, you know, he, I, and I hate to say this, but he did that, you know, creepy little girl voice from, um, poltergeist. He said, they're back, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I kind of looked at him, I was in a hurry. Like I had a, a ton to do on deployment. I didn't have time to just even stop and think about this too much. And as I'm passing him, I'm kind of like, what, you know, are you serious? And he's like, yep. And I was like, no way. And then I was just kind of on my way. This is in passing. Um, and so they did, they came back when we were on station. Wow. And so was that described as a similar object to the gimbal? Uh, you know, I, I never heard any description of it at that time. Um, like I said, I, I was busy with my stuff. I was working maybe 15, 20 hours a day. So, uh, yeah, I, I did. We were in an active war zone, zone, I suppose. So right. Yeah, focus. exactly. I had other things to do. Um, Nah, that's understandable completely. So let's fast forward a couple of years to, you know, the release of the videos from To The Stars Academy. Do you remember how, uh, sort of where you were or when you first saw it on, on the TV or in the papers or anything and how it made you feel? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I was, it was another kind of, I feel like this, the release of it to the New York Times and seeing it, kind of on my phone was a bigger shock to me than the event itself <laughs> if that makes any sense because yeah because i wasn't busy at the time right I, at the time i had transferred to washington dc i was working at the office of naval intelligence and you know my brother texts me one day and says hey there's this article in the new york times about ufos and the government's ufo program <laughs> And he said, there's footage. And I said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll check it out. I really, uh, to me, this was not a conversation I wanted to have with him because my job was not something that I discussed at all. Um, I wasn't at liberty to discuss it. So I, I couldn't really talk about things that I had seen um, behind closed doors. But so I watched the footage and I just kind of... Uh, you know, I was a big shock to see this footage that I first saw on a skiff. Um, now I'm watching it on my phone. That was something that never happens. I so I it was, you know, to, to see it, it, it's like this is classified. Why is this out in the public? You know, and I was just very uneasy about that, uh, just kind of very immediately uneasy about that because you when you deal with classified material and classified information, it's just drilled into you that there's a place and a time for that. And watching it on your cell phone is not, <laughs> <laughs> is not something that should be happening. Right. Um, so, you know, I was just very shocked um, by all of that. And, and that, that kind of made me want to dig into the topic a little bit more because it mentioned specific people and organizations. And I, and I knew being an intelligence analyst, I thought, well, I'm going to drill down on those sources and see what I can find for myself, you know? Yeah. So where did that lead you? Where did you start? If you don't uh, mind me asking. Yeah. So I, 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 I read some valet, um, and, uh, I read, uh, you know, some of Tom DeLong's books, um, because he was, you know, with TTSA and mentioned in the article. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't, you know, I, I, of course I knew that these people were credible people. Um, you know, Chris Mellon, assistant secretary of defense for intelligence. I mean, these people aren't just, just anybody coming out and saying this, you know, so I, I knew that there was some weight behind this. Uh, so I just started reading books, you know, uh, first, Tom DeLong stuff. Then Tom DeLong had written the the forward, or uh, Valet had written the forward to one of Tom DeLong's books. So I, that's what got me into Valet. One thing kind of led to another, and um, man, it was a crazy ride. <laughs> Absolutely, and I suppose the one thing is, is if all of what we've discussed so far wasn't you know exciting enough, right? 
uh, let's move on to what happened to you after all that. And and boy, a lot happened. So, yeah. I mean, I'll leave it up to you where to start. But what what was the first thing afterwards or, or that came to light about you actually experiencing something for yourself? Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, I became an experiencer after that. I guess that's the word you would use. Uh, and I, you know, I, I went through this, this experience where I, the, the first thing that happened um, was, you know, when I started digging into this, I started to feel very uneasy about things because I, I didn't want to believe, you know, that uh, beings were in people's room at night, uh, that, that any of this was happening. Um, and so that made me very uneasy, but I, I was still looking into it nonetheless. Um, cause I thought, well, you know, I didn't think UFOs were real. So why, why would I think that any of this other experience or stuff isn't real? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I just, I, the first book that I came across that really had to do with this topic, um, which just, uh, was was also another life altering experience. Was that I had this day of coincidences. Um, people co sometimes call them synchronicities, but they were they were coincidences that were so um, so far out there that they were terrifying when you put them all together, um, and. Uh, it led me to reading this book um, called The Kavalian by the Three Initiates. Um, and that was that was the first book I read because I knew that that had something to do with this uh, after after this day of impossible coincidences that just scared the bejesus out of me. Right. Because it was so purposeful, too. It was it was coincidences in such a way that something wanted me to know that these coincidences were constructed this way. Right. And that is terrifying um, mm. to think of. Um, and so, uh, you know, I read this book, the Kabbalion by the three initiates, and it was written in, I think, 1909 or eight or something by a guy named William Walker Atkinson. And it, it just describes these seven, seven universal principles that govern the universe. And then, of course, uh, everything that followed that, um, you know, beings in my room at night, whatever other experiences I had, they all kind of fit in with that book. Um, and, and that book is certainly not something I would have read otherwise. Uh, you know, he was, he was a rather famous occult writer. Um, wow. I mean, you mentioned there beings in your room. Can you, are you able to kind of expand on that a bit and describe kind of what happened and, you know, what they look like and whether any kind of messages were relayed or, or things like that? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I saw several different types um, throughout uh, these experiences. The, the first one was... Um, and I, I was not a religious person at the time. I, I never have believed in that. I've never been a churchgoer. I wasn't raised in a household where anybody believed any of that. So I was, I was very much science based and grounded. My parents were both college graduates uh, with with STEM backgrounds. So uh, to think of some white bearded man in the sky was just total fantasy to me and uh and not even in the realm of anything that i believed but so uh the first experience i had was i was in my room after having read the Kabbalion. i was asleep one night and i felt something grab my arm uh and wake me up uh so i i opened my eyes and I'm in my room and I'm laying on my back. I don't, I don't ever lay on my back uh, when I sleep because I eventually will just snore myself awake uh, <laughs> if I do that. Um, so I, I wake up on my back and I'm looking at my window and I thought the window's going blurry. 
you know, like my vision was clear and then it starts going blurry. So I went to go raise my hand to my face to wipe the sleep out of my eyes and I couldn't move. Um, wow. So uh, I thought, oh, wait a minute, I woke up because something grabbed my arm. And so I kind of fight to turn my head to the right and I see this uh, shadowy figure standing over me. Um, just like a torso, two arms and a head like bent over looking at me and I and as I'm looking at this all of a sudden my room starts to light up from behind this entity and like this golden light and then the light becomes blinding it so bright and then uh, the light concentrates into these rays of golden light coming out of her head uh, and um, I thought to myself what is going on you know, this is bizarre. Um, so I, I fell back asleep. Um, and then I started having this sexual dream, uh, which was also an odd dream because it was, it was just an ex of mine from 20 years ago and myself. And there was nothing else around. Um, it was just total pitch black darkness, right? And um, so then I wake up again. I'm back in my room. And I can see that there's this woman on top of me who has blue skin um, and my hands are on her thighs and I can feel her skin is not like normal human skin. It's, it's thicker and tighter than normal human skin. Um, you know, and I, I realized that in, in talking about this, people are like, wow, this guy has lost his mind, right? <laughs> This is this is crazy talk. But uh, keep in mind, while this is happening, I'm working at the Office of Naval Intelligence, right? Um, so I, I I'm not fooled. I'm not uh, you know deluding myself. This is happening, right? And um, you know, I, I started to pick apart that experience uh, in terms of. Uh, the book, The Kabbalion, that I read about. And, um, you know, one of the principles is that the universe is mental, um, that you can think of the universe as a mental creation of a singular consciousness of which we are all a part, right? right. Yeah. And um, I, I kind of, I feel like that whole experience was just like a, a pre prelude of things to come. Right. It was the, the light rays of light coming from the head kind of uh, uh, as a as a, an allegory for the mental universe to think of this as a mental thing rather than uh, anything else. Right. These these experiences that follow, they're all mental and you need to th think of them and and kind of conceptualize them in that way uh as as allegory for the mental universe and i that that's kind of the 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 scope through which i view all of this now um uh so yeah i i i am not your typical experiencer i i don't have the typical views of this that people normally do i i tend to look at if I'm looking for sources for all of this, I tend to look at things that have come down through centuries, right? That are time tested. Yeah. I, I love the works of Plato. I love the works of other philosophers that that spoke on these topics um, and the nature of reality um, because they knew what they were talking about. There's a reason their their works have survived for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate you, you going into detail there. So would you say from these experiences there was an overall message of positivity or would it lean more towards negativity? I mean, what was the overall kind of feeling you got? Um, I'm, I'm glad the whole thing happened to me for sure. Um, you know, believe it or not. The, I, so I wrote a book about all of this. It's called Initiated because I realized at the end of this that this was an initiatory process, right, that – conditions one's mind to start thinking of the universe in a certain way so that at the end of the experiences, hopefully if you've played your cards right, 
you come into this uh, thing that has been described as like nirvana or enlightenment at the end, which I certainly did. And, and in thinking about it allegorically, I, I came to understand something very important. And that is that you, once you awaken and you can see this and you're thinking in terms of allegory and you're starting to look at the world differently, you can see that reality is in fact just layered allegory. Everything right. is, is an allegory. Um, and that that's what reality is. It's, it's an allegory for a reality that underlies it. And that's what our physical reality is. And, and it just, it blows my mind still to this day uh, when I think about it and kind of perceive it out there. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that goes above people's heads, but. I mean, it doesn't necessarily go above my head. It's like you said, you know, you're not the stereotypical experiencer, but then I was thinking straight away, well, is there a stereotypical experiencer? <laughs> I mean, I've spoken to a few and then my good friend, Jay Christopher King runs the experiencer group. And, you know, the amount of differences between a lot of what, what he's you know, come across, I'm sure are just vast. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, I'm sure there's all sorts happening out there. Um, but, but was this something that still continues to this day for you? Yeah, it does. Um, you know, there was, uh, the author of the Kabbalion was good friends with this woman at, uh, of the time, um, back in the early 1900s, who was named Mabel Collins, who wrote several books uh, about this. And uh, one of those books was um, When the Sun Moves Northward, The Way of Initiation, right? And and I read several books about initiation. And one of the things she describes is that there is this thing called waking clairvoyance, right? And, and I, exper I started to experience this voice that I would hear when I was in the, the state between awake and asleep. And I still to this day hear it. Um, and it will give me the name of an author to read maybe or... Uh, an artist to look at or uh, something else. And then I'll see how it's connected to all of this, right? And, and, and I'll write about it. I'm actually working on another book called um, Master of Animals is the working title. And, and I'm, I named it after this ancient motif, right? Of, and it's just a motif from all over the world. It was everywhere that depicts... Um, a person standing between two animals kind of holding them at bay. And, and it represents kind of this idea of taking the Buddhist middle road, right? Where you're right. keeping, keeping these beasts at bay in the mind on either side of you, uh, to, to walk that middle road, that, that fine line where you are none of those beasts. Right. And, um, and so that's what I'm, what I'm calling this new book. <laughs> I like it. I like the idea of it. I mean, one thing that, that comes across to me is that throughout all of this, you know, as I'm sure it was terrifying, but you seem quite grounded. So it's almost like you've you found a way to deal with it or figure it out. But I mean, during these times, did you have anyone to talk to about it or, or was it kind of something you kept to yourself? Uh, I didn't. I, I kept it to myself. Uh, I, I talked to my brother about it a little bit and I, I was lucky enough that he believed me. You know what I mean? Like he, yeah. cause he, he knows me, right? So he knows that I'm a very grounded and serious person. And I had a very serious job, um, which I also took very seriously. Uh, but, you know, so he knew that if I was saying this, there's something, something is happening here, you know? Um, so he, he didn't disbelieve anything that I was telling him. And in fact, you know, to this day, I, I talk to him about it all the time. And then, um, you know, post my experiences and, and me figuring it out, I, I would kind of, I, I, I became like a philosopher, you know, in a sense, like at work, we would, we would go like the people I work with, in my immediate sphere at work, we would go down and eat lunch together. And we would have um, woke Wednesdays, they called it, where 
people would ask me about life and I would kind of answer their questions and and guide them. <laughs> wow, that sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so do you do you, you know you mentioned all this sort of philo philosophical side of things. Do you do you link now like all different aspects of say the phenomena, whether it be the occult aspects, the paranormal, you know, the extraterrestrial, do you think it's all linked in some way? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that all the world's religions relate to this um, in terms of the philosophy of it. When uh, that, that to me at this point is just fairly obvious. And if you know okay. what you're, if you know what you're looking at, then then you can see that all the world's religions, in fact, are the same. They're all describing the same thing. Um, but, but a lot of people don't do that because they, they like to look at these stories and they, and they interpret them in their own way. Um, yeah. but, but once you've seen what I've seen, it becomes clear. It's like, oh, that's what all this is, you know? And I had, I had no idea before. Um, and I, you know, in terms of like the universe being allegory, um, your your last guest, Diana Pasolka, was on. And um, one of the things that I like to talk about is is that whether or not you're an introvert or an extrovert will depend on how you relate to this allegory, right? right. That, that is your relationship to the allegory. A lot of people think introversion and extroversion are just these these um, qualities that you can possess, but they're much more than that. These are two different planes of mental existence that don't see each other at all. And that's kind of the reason for a lot of the strife that we see in politics today. But uh, so Diana Pasolka described something that I thought was very interesting about Ryan Bledsoe and his family. Um, and how he was kind of at the end of his experiences he had built this garden right to feed to feed the world he said mm -hmm. right and that was something that he wanted to do and so you know when you think about eating and and drinking you're consuming right you're consuming information even um and so that too becomes something allegorical right and that's what you know, drinking the the body and the blood of Christ is all about. It's an allegory for the knowledge of Christ, right? And so you you have this guy who's decided he's going to build this garden to feed the world, but he's he's acting on this in an extroverted way, right? He's 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 making this garden rather than um, feeding the world with knowledge. Right. So mm. so that's like the, that. Those are like the two different levels, introvert and extrovert. And and when you see this in the world, it starts to become fairly obvious um, that that that's the way things are. And that's what reality is. Uh, it's very. It's very scary, actually, <laughs> <laughs> because you can see people relating to one another in an extroverted way and. You can see countries relating to each other in an extroverted way, and and it's it just becomes very very scary because you you know where that can end up, right? And yeah, and and a lot of experiencers they're shown like these apocalyptic scenes, right, of destruction and death um, and things like that. But that that's an allegory for this experience, right? You are you, you're inner life is in turmoil at this point, right? Because you're going through this initiation and you, your, your whole life has been upended and it's catastrophic and you're very emotional, you're very depressed. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of, they're showing you the extroverted allegory of that to right. represent what's happening to you inside. Right. And, and that, and people don't always get the symbolism that Jim Semivan talks about how this is, they, they, they speak to us in symbols, right? And so you have to interpret those symbols and interpret the experiences as allegory to kind of unwrap what's happening to you. Makes sense. Yeah. Cause you know, I, I never really stopped to think about it that much, but it does, you know, 
does make sense that it's doesn't necessarily depict what it means it, you know you have to right. translate it to yeah that that yeah i appreciate that and it's given me food for thought let's say so no, yeah and good. and that's why people talk about high strangeness because they don't mm. realize this about the phenomenon so they want to take these experiences at face value and when yeah. you do that it's nonsense you know um and and that's why you call it high strangeness because it doesn't yeah. make any sense any other way yeah valid point absolutely um i just got a question here from uh Jay Allen, could you ask if we can parallel this with Hitchhiker reported by the DIA folks? If so, do you have any theories regarding the purpose or intent? And maybe comment uh, on the contagion theory. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think I think it is contagious because, you know, as someone like me, right, I, I start to experience things and the people around me knew that I was incredibly level headed, right, and very just grounded. Um, mm. And I've been told by many people in the past that, hey, you're you're the most level headed person I know, <laughs> you know, uh, because there's very little that would ever make me upset. I was just very always calm, cool, collected. And yet here I am talking about this stuff that's uh, in the realm of Tim Foyle hats. So there must be something to it, you know. Um, and so then, you know, it gets other people thinking, well, OK, this is real you know, and so the phenomenon will recognize, hey, that person, we can maybe get them to realize this as well. Let's let's try to initiate them too, you know, and so that's how this kind of spreads it. Once you once I forgot who said it, it was a quote I read recently that once you become aware of the phenomenon, it becomes aware of you. And that's kind of that's kind of how this hitchhiker effect happens, you know, because if you if you're working on this behind closed doors, obviously, you know, it's real. Right. And then you're going to see extra types of footage, uh, uh, photographs, um, whatever, and it'll be crystal clear. Um, I've seen some of that um, and I don't know why they don't come out with it. Uh, but, you know, so that too will get you thinking, you know, mm -hmm. and then, and then the phenomenon suddenly has an inroad with you, you know, cause you now understand that this is real. This isn't, you're not waking up in the middle of the night and this is just a bad dream. You know, uh, some people can't tell the difference. I can. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of what the hit, that's how I would describe the hitchhiker effect anyway. It's just that the, the the phenomenon realizes it has an inroad there with you, and so it will latch on to that and and kind of follow you. But the mm -hmm. question is, the question is right, and this is the difference between a successful initiation and a failure: is that where are you going to go with it? You know, how brave are you? Are you going to go? Are you going to dive headlong into this, or are you going to resist it? and run away and uh most people i think most people find that they're kind of really not brave enough to face it it's not it's not an easy thing it is not mm. an easy thing i have people who come across my book in very paranormal ways uh similar to the way i came across the Kabbalion, and sometimes they're suicidal when they're talking to me because they're like am i am i going crazy what's what's happening to me, you know? And that, that's one of the reasons why I am all for disclosure. You know, this, this should have never been a secret ever. It's a part of the, the natural universe. It's like saying that water is classified or air <laughs> is classified. It's just, it's, it simply is. So let's talk about it, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. So do you think disclosure will come, you know, sooner rather than later? And if so, where will it come from? Do you think that the government are able to disclose? Do you think they're not because they don't understand it? Like where, how do you see things currently? Um, I think that there are very few, if, if I, I, there's, there's almost no one who understands this. Um, I, I, I would say that, and, and that's very scary to me because, uh, you know, there's all kinds of theories out there that are just bunk, 
and and I hate to think that people in the government are latching on to some of those bunk theories, but I think unfortunately some of them probably are. Um, and uh, that's unfortunate. Um, and you know, I uh, so I, I they don't they don't have any idea what's going on. There may be individuals within the apparatus that have an idea, just like I do. Um, mm. But of course, you know. Uh, people being what they are, they'll say, Oh, well, that's just, that's just your opinion, right? You don't, you don't actually know what you're talking about, but, but that's not the truth of it. Right. And one of the, one of the great things about all of this that I think, um, th that I think has come out is just that I was watching an interview with, uh, Dr. Gary Nolan the other day. It's kind of a, a lesser known interview. The, the podcast host wasn't very well known, but one of the things he said is that there's some really good news in this, in that, you know, we have it in our heads that with, with all of our problems and that, that we can't possibly solve all of this, that we're going to end up destroying ourselves, right? But there's good news in that someone was able to move past that, right? Now we have kind of some evidence that there's more right? We, we can get past that. And so the question now becomes, how do we move from point A where we are now to point B where we kind of suspect they are? Because they have mm. all this high tech. It didn't destroy them. They can use it responsibly. Um, so how do we get there? And, and that's the big question, right? And, and I think that uh, things like philosophy and, and theology kind of answer those questions right I, I don't think i don't think a mathematician or a physicist is going to be an, able to answer that for you but uh but philosophy certainly can interesting absolutely and you mentioned gary nolan there and you know he's been involved with a lot of study of experiences um over, over the you know over time have you ever been approached by anybody to to you know be looked at let's say by by any of these people um, I, you know, I, th there was, I was aware of the study that was happening, um, while I was, you know, working at ONI, but I, I, I was kind of too late to participate in it. So I, yeah. to my knowledge, my information is not involved in that study. Um, I, I could be wrong. I don't, I don't know, but I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I never had any scans. There was, Right. Uh, certainly some talk of that, but I, I never ended up getting any any brain scans. Interesting. So you mentioned that you're obviously you're writing the new book. Is there anything else that you've got going on at the moment or, or is kind of that kind of your main focus? Uh, no, I, yeah, that's that's kind of my main focus. I, I try to keep kind of a low profile. I don't uh, I don't I don't. There's so many people that, you know, they they want followers. I just don't. You, you follow me or don't, I don't really care. This, the choice is yours. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if you follow me, I'm going to talk about some really interesting things. Uh, but, uh, if you don't, I'm, I'm not going to be heartbroken about it. And, and I, and I certainly don't, I, I, I don't get wrapped up in that drama online too much. Um, uh, it's just, it's nonsense that I, that I don't feel a need to participate in, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, I look forward to the book coming out. I've got your other book on my pile still to read. Um, I could just thank you enough because this has been a fascinating conversation and I've been following you for some time and, mm -hmm. I, and I really do appreciate you and, and your outlook. So yeah, once again, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me, Vinny. My pleasure. Uh, everyone in the live chat, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't get to all of your questions. Um, yeah thank you for being good as always uh i'm gonna be back next week go and follow me on social medias to find out who i'm i'm sorry i've been redoing my schedules the last few days and it's just completely confused me so yeah um oh nick brown thank you so much for the donation uh this is a unique the hitchhiker element is real i'm on the isle of more scotland and i sense a presence above me when i'm walking my dog i know it's above me and with me personal i guess that's a really good point i suppose it is it's personal and it's up to the individual how they perceive things 
So, yeah, really cool. Once again, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. And I'll see you next time. Take care.